Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have given me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mehujael, and Mehujael fathered Methusael, and Methusael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal, who was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal-Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal-Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, as we get a view here of this community, this society, this culture, I'd ask you, God, that as people that believe your book, believe the truth of it, that, Father, we would um, hear from you and have an understanding of what you want to teach us from it. So thank you, Lord, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Recently have thought about this because of dealing with Cain, uh, the Cain and Abel story. Last week we talked about sin crouching at the door. Uh, Do we feed that sin? Do we train that sin? Do we ultimately have what we have with that sin? And then we have a result of it. I was thinking about this whole idea of men with anger. Why are men angry? And there's an article in in a magazine, uh, Men's Health, from April 2007 here with uh, David Wright on the cover. It says, Why so angry? New research confirms it. Men are mad as hell. Problem is, our rage isn't just hurting us. It's killing us. Talked about the baby-faced kid is crushed against the chain-link octagon, swallowing punches from a fighter twice his size. His skin glows under the lights until something gives way, and soon he's covered in blood. He's done, pinned, but too proud to tap out. Yet the crowd jeers when the ref stops the fight. Even his father protests. Somehow this Cleveland cage fight has become Caesar's Coliseum. Why so angry? That's the question I'm mulling ringside. And I'm not talking about the grapplers. As combatants in the unofficial minor leagues of the ultimate fighting championship, one of the fastest growing sports in America, their anger is subsidized. I'm talking about the fans. According to a 2006 Harvard study, 10 million adult men in the United States are so angry. Listen to this. This is this got me. And this is back from 2006. They're so angry they're sick. In fact, this is gonna, you're going to enjoy this, their disease has a name, intermittent explosive disorder. 
or IED. The condition has been on the books since 1980, but the Harvard study claims it's far more common than anyone believed. Few people see psychiatrists because they can't control their tempers. And those who do say the researchers are often misdiagnosed with other mental problems. Previous estimates put the number of IED sufferers in America at less than 0.5% of the population. But if the Harvard researchers are correct, almost one in 10 adult men routinely display wildly disproportionate aggression and are so angry that they're likely to damage property or threaten or injure others. The researchers estimate that only half as many women suffer from IED. Now, stay with me. I know I'm reading, but this is, this is a classic to me. Considered alone, the symptoms of the disorder are easy to dismiss. A commuter flipping off a fellow driver in a traffic jam, a basketball player charging the stands during an NBA game, the guy I saw a few rows back screaming at the hot dog vendor because he had no mustard left. left. But there's more behind an IED diagnosis than a few isolated acts of rage. If you're blowing up a couple of times a week, you probably have the disorder. Two times a week. If you get mad two times a week, you got that disorder. And I'm thinking, really? And how does that play out? Another article, Psychology Today, from August 2012. Why would anyone, man or woman, still engage in temper tantrums as a grown adult? There are actually a few reasons, but one reason is particularly important. The people who engage in this behavior do so because they are able to get away with it without suffering serious consequences. Far too often, the loved ones tell themselves that the one with the temper can't truly change. I explain consistently with my clients that people can't necessarily change their personality, but can change their behaviors, and they talk about intermittent explosive disorder again. And as time goes by, there's going to be more and more disorders. There's listed, um, recently I found out about other behavioral disorders, and they'll have names, and, and they'll have uh, qualifications put them. And I thought, hmm, there might be something to us talking about it. But as time goes by, is everything going to be called a disorder? Is everything going to have an excuse? I thought about this, I, and I asked some guys um, before today, this week, I asked them, I said, why do you think men are so angry? And I picked men for a moment, because I know you ladies can get angry. I understand that. And it may play out differently for a man or for a woman, but let me just think about men, or we can think about all of us, but why do we get angry? One of the things that came through as we were discussing is there's expectations that we all have. And I may have used this before with you, but there's the expectation of, I'm going to go mow the lawn. And there is a lawnmower in my garage. And I go and I fill it up with gas and I did everything that I thought was right, choke and everything, and I start pulling. After the fifth time, that thing's supposed to start up. And if it doesn't, I'm mad at it, so much so that I kick it. I don't know, but I, I, the, the feeling is there's an expectation this is owed to me. That thing is supposed to work. And when it doesn't, I'm angry. Or I'm entitled to things. I, it's so intriguing watching, and I think I've talked to you before, watching people's response to southbound traffic at Boonslick. Okay, so there's the Kroger there. You're heading southbound on 47. And there's two lanes that can go south. You guys, some of you already know where I'm going with this. And, and there's a truck in that left lane, and I'm over here, and I see all these Warrington people behind it. And I go, well, I'm a Warrington person, but you know what? I'm also a person that grew up in Chicago. <laughs> and so I'm thinking I'll just pull up to the right there, and then when the light changes, we'll move. And if there's a car or two cars or a truck right in front of that semi, this could get interesting. Because I'm looking over, I'm going, sizing up, okay, how old is this person? <laughs> how, and that, by the way, I, I've been so deceived, that don't mean anything. <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. And then, 
there's the thing when I'm the guy here and there's somebody pulls up next to me and you could just tell they're like edging, they're edging. And I, and I want to say to them, I understand. And guess what? I'm letting you in. Why? Because I'm a great guy. Okay. And so I don't even, there's times I sit, you know, send lights or flash my lights because there's a truck that accidentally gets over there. And then, oh, the people, you don't let them in. Because why? Because it, I'm entitled to this. I'm angry. Or not being appreciated. People taking advantage of you. You hold a door open for somebody, and people walk through and they don't say thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you don't do that to me. I thought enough of you to hold a door open. I'm, mm. And we could list thing after thing. Why are we angry? And then, you know, we're talking about men and women. Some both handle it in different ways. There could be the loud verbal person or there could be the passive aggressive person. And by the way, just as sinister and as evil, maybe even more, because it can have this appearance of, boy, you seem to be under control, but down, it's just fuming, okay? And God wants to work on all of that. We come to a context here, and the title of today's sermon is The Avenged Sevenfold Life. Avenged Sevenfold is actually the name of a heavy metal band that, um, as I looked... Uh, at uh, the Walmart list of CDs and looked at the logo there. There's an, there's an element of, of um, anger, and the, the, the cool word now is angst, that is permeating our society. That actually is nothing new. And why, you, we got to stop and ask ourselves, why is there... Why is that going on? And, and part of the discussion with the guys that came up with is, we want our lives to be perfect. We expect our lives to be perfect. We expect life to go a certain way. And when it doesn't, we're angry. We've got expectations. We've got goals. We've got ideas of how things should be. And we just get so angry. And we come to Cain here. And, and as we talked about last week, there was an element of grace in the conversation that God came to him and said, I just want you to know, why are you so angry after Cain had given a, an, a sacrifice that was not acceptable to God? He came with the way, and there must have been an acceptable thing. God's not one that keeps secrets. And so there was this idea uh, or this, this understanding. There must have been this understanding. This is what acceptable worship is. And so there had to be a blood sacrifice. God, it wasn't written in there, but God was communicating with them because we see he's communicating. And so he's having that communication with, with Adam and Eve, and he's ultimately having this communication with their sons, Cain and Abel. And Abel does what is right because his heart is right. And we know his heart is right because Hebrews 11 tells us that his heart was right. But Cain doesn't, and he comes to God on his own terms. And when God, he had expectations about God. And when God doesn't respond the way he thinks he, he should respond, he's angry. And God has to go to him, pre him doing something stupid. And you've seen this before. I don't know if you've seen this before, where you see the anger burning in somebody. We've had opportunity at times where we're playing basketball and somebody fouls somebody else or they steal the ball and they foul somebody else and this person is making their way to the basket. They're making their way back. And you watch the person that just got burned. And the look, you can just see it in their eye. Oh no, this could get interesting near the basket. Because now this person is making a beeline toward that person and it's either they're going to try to block the shot or they're going to do whatever it takes. That's why we've got these pads behind the basket. All right? They're going to do whatever it takes to make sure you are not going to burn me. Make me look bad. So ultimately that, and you can just see it, and there's a part of me that wants to run out in the court. Stop! Stop! Before something bad happens. Something really painful happens. And I think that was the Lord. He, he, he comes and he sees sins crouching at your door. And so he's, he's gets in there and he's like, I don't want you to do something stupid. And out of grace, I'm telling you, you better get master over this. Talking to one of the individuals whose wife is a, 
uh, teacher at the school, and this is just good old Warrington. You know, we're talking about, who's kidding who? We got so much stuff behind the curtain here, too. But it's the truth. We, we're sh- we are sheltered. But I think when these teachers are coming in contact and the anger in these little children, because probably in their heart they had expectations of what a family should look like. And their heart is broken and they're angry and they're lashing out. And why they're lashing out? There's a bunch of different reasons. One of them maybe they constantly see mom and dad lashing out. And so God in his grace is coming to Cain and he's going, you better get master over this. And so we come up to, the, to that little one and stuff. And there's something, there's deeper things here. So let's, let's get into this context a little bit over the avenged sevenfold life. Point number one, if you want to take notes, there's a section in your bulletin to do that. Point number one, issues without God. Issues without God. Look at verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. It's the first murder in Scripture. The New Testament talks about these things just to show you that Jesus alluded to them. Matthew 23, 35. So that on the... So that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of innocent Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Barakiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. So Jesus used this as an example, not only in Matthew, but in Luke, Luke chapter 11, verse 51, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Then Hebrews 12, verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So Jesus ultimately was the one that would have to come and sacrifice. But we see pictures of all these things leading to the ultimate person, Jesus Christ. Cain had rejected the wisdom spoken to him by God himself. God had spoken to him. It wasn't like he he was reading this book and like, oh, this... God spoke to him. Sin had pounced after it had crouched and turned him into a killer. 1 John 3, 10 through 12. But this is evident who are children of God. Look at the, the difference, the, the black and white of the issue. Sometimes we, there's a lot of gray, we understand. There's a lot, but there's a lot of black and white. But it is evident who are children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. They had a conversation. You see that. He spoke to his brother. He talked to his brother Abel what that must have been like. It's so good when we watch our children talk with one another and they do it civilly. Isn't that nice? It's a great thing to see. I like how John Phillips, a commentator, he thinks the conversation might have gone. This is Cain talking to Abel. Your religion is disgusting and offensive, a religion of the shambles. Your gospel is a gospel of gore. It is repulsive to a refined, sensitive, moral human being. And what did it cost you? Nothing. Look how much effort I put into my religion. I refuse to believe my effort is worthless. Look at your disgusting altar. Look at it, red with blood, black with smoke, stinking to high heaven. Look at mine. Look how beautiful it is. Come and smell the herbs and flowers. Confess that my way is better than yours. You think about it, what Jesus had to accomplish for our justification, it is brutal. But it had to be done because that's how ugly our sin is. And it is by the shedding of blood that there is remission of sin. See, Cain's religion leads to death. Kill, this word is the word for intentional murder. I, I want you to realize that as we, as we share the gospel with individuals and we get to the nitty-gritty of it, there are people that are well-meaning, sweet people that will not like it. They want a religion of pulling weeds and planting flowers and never talking about the blood of Christ, never talking about sin. We'll talk about the, the greatness of men and how, how we're going to just... Elevate this culture, and God is saying, you gotta, you got to own it, to own up to some stuff, and ultimately, I'm going to do a work of changing individual lives. 
Let's keep going. Verse 9. Then the Lord, Yahweh, said to Cain, after this murder, Where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Once again, God initiates a conversation with man. He asks a question, and we can either own up or lie. And Cain's sarcasm was a play on words. You realize that he's saying, am I my brother's keeper? And remember what Abel did for a living? He's a keeper of sheep. He's mocking God in his response. So think about, think about how far we've come. Adam and Eve sinned. Do you remember their response? Remember their response? They hide. They're embarrassed. They're scared. And they're, they'll start some blame shifting, but they're, for the most part, they're kind of overwhelmed with the fact, oh boy, I, I messed with daddy. Now we get one generation removed. What happens? It's defiance. You ever have that? Where you confront somebody and there's a defiance? It's not a brokenness. It's not, and you'd want, whoa, now you want anger? It's not only defiance, but look at this. He lies. He flat out lied. Lying was the result of Cain's indifference to God's command. Sin is ruling over him. He said, I don't want you to get, have sin master you. Sin was mastering him. See, false religion is full of deception and it's full of fraud. And we hide our sin. Verse 10. And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. This is a figure of speech to show that Abel's death was well known to God. And by the way, every time God asks a question, it isn't because he's ignorant. It's not because he needs information. God never needs information. He knows everything. He's asking these questions to get us thinking. Get keen thinking. Verse 11. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. A second curse comes from God affecting Cain, specifically on the soil that Cain would till. Since Cain was a farmer, this would be a significant curse. There's, I'm not going to receive any more hypocritical offerings from you, Cain. Verse 12. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. His job would even be more difficult and lead to looking for work that would be effective. His life would be a wilderness. It would be meaningless and wasted. Satisfaction would evade him. He would be, look at this, the, the words here. He would be a wandering wanderer. But I want you to look at his response. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. There's no repentance. There's no, no remorse. There's just resentment. I tell you, you can tell somebody when they're completely repentant. There, there's just a humility that comes, a brokenness that comes. Verse 14. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. He fears the avenging hand of God, but he was concerned very little about God's hand. He's more concerned about men. You see that? This is the creator God that has ultimate power. He's not fearing him as much. He is, he is being so sarcastic. He's being demanding. He's being this way. And he's fearing this individual that could crush him as opposed, he's fearing these people and not God. And I tell you, if I'm looking at the scriptures right, I see that God is looking for confession and he's looking for an acknowledgement and he's looking for a humility and he's looking for a brokenness and he would not have even had to give an offering physically and there would have been a response of God of mercy. The Bible says in the word, to obey is better than sacrifice. You see, the fear of man brings a snare. 
Look at verse 15. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. So look at the grace. Not so. He said, I, I'm scared. If, 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 if it's the case that you, you know, if something isn't done here and, and, and things don't work out, now people are going to know I'm Cain the murderer and everybody's going to be out to kill me, which, by the way, means that there's more people on the earth at this time. In verse 15, he says, And the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. They believe, by the way, there's many that believe this is the beginning of tattooing, all right? That uh, a mark was given to him. And God would still take care of him. This mark is not described here. It's involved. It may involve some identified mark that was so that he was under divine protection and is mercifully given. This mark would be a mark that would save him, but it would also be the mark of his shame. Don't know what it looked like, but the grace of God, he puts a mark on it. So, second point. Second point. Indifference to God. Look at verse 16. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain leaves God since God rejected his religion. This word nod means land of wanderings and it looks like he never came back. It's interesting. You see that word there? It says Cain went away from the presence of God. Remember what the, one of the curses was for him? You are going to be a what? He's going to be a wanderer. He's going to be a vagabond. He's going to be moving on. And the word here says that he settled in the land of nod. And this land is the, it's called the land of Nod, which could be a land of wanderings where he just never settled down, where, but he was in a certain geographical area of this. But there also might be a part where it's like, I know you told me that I would be a wanderer, but I'm going to do whatever it takes not to still listen to you. I'm going to settle down. Verse 17, Cain knew his wife. That creates interesting questions sometimes. Bottom line is it would have to be one of his sisters. This, the baby that comes along, she conceived and bore Enoch. Enoch means initiated or inaugurated, so a start of something. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. By Moses' time, that kind of close marriage was forbidden because of the genetic decay. But Cain initiates a new city. Isn't that interesting? He's a wanderer, but he's initiating a city, and he names a city after his son. And usually when somebody would name a city, it would be after themselves. But what he's probably finding is everything that he initiates along those lines isn't working, and so he creates this thing that he starts that ultimately his son Enoch has to take over because the reality is it never worked for him because he's a wanderer. He's under this curse. Cain was without God. And this is a new way of life. Indifference to God. Point number three, independence from God. Verse 18. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mehujael, and Mehujael fathered Methushiel, and Methushiel fathered Lamech. Let me just go through these names for a moment, what they mean. Irad means fugitive, city of witness, or wild ass. Mehujael, smitten of God, or blot out that Yah is God. Methusael, man who is of God, or they died inquiring. And Lamech, powerful conqueror, wild man. So you see these names taking, just, it's just getting interesting how these names take uh, on a new life of their own. What next, talk about names, next week we're going to have an interesting time working through chapter 5, which is um, the genealogies. Verse 19, and Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. 
So we have Adam and Eve and their sin. We have Cain and his sin and those that follow him. And ultimately we get to Lamech who is going to sin in the way Lamech is going to sin. And he starts bigamy in open rebellion against God's pattern of marriage law. Genesis 2, verse 24. Genesis 2, 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The pattern in Scripture set up in Genesis early on was one man, one woman. So as time progresses and these individuals take on the roles that they take on, we get farther and farther from an idea of what God wants, and then I'm going to do it, and I don't care what you think. I'm going to be defiant. I, don't, I, don't, I know God says this. I don't care, and guess what? It's not that I don't care even. It's also, and you have to agree that what I'm doing is okay. And we'll see this more and more and more and more. And I could start listing the different things that I just come in contact with where I'll say, hey, this is the standard, and they'll just look at me. And they're like, no way. And you, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, and you better like it. Ada, by the way, means ornamental or pretty. Zilla means shade or a seductress or sweet-voiced. So we've got him picking a girl pretty and sweet-voiced. Some preachers have said that Lamech picked him A to Z. Verse 20. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents, and have livestock. This Jabal became a nomad. Most of this generation did city life. He was the father of this lifestyle. He became the pioneer with cattle ranching. He was the marketer. Jabal means the producer. I want you to see something. We talked about this a little bit Wednesday with the whole idea of common grace. There's a theological com- concept concerning the idea of grace, and one of the concepts about grace that is just amazing is the fact that God is, has common grace over the world. The, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. People that get up that could care less about God, they use his name in vain all the time. He still has sunlight come down on them and gives them warmth, gives them rain, gives them all good things, even if, even if they deny his existence. That's the common grace of God. And we see here, these are not godly people from how the word talks about them, but he gives them, because he's given them the image of God, the capability of putting together a business and being successful in it. And by the way, I think we, as individuals that call upon the name of the Lord, we actually benefit from those that are lost because of the image of God in their life. Look at verse 21. So we have one that's a a producer, one that's a businessman. Verse 21, his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. His specialty was music. The word means, the word Jubal, the undulator or a joyful sound, the entertainer. This is the person, so we've got Lamech who takes on these two wives and from these two wives comes these children and we have one that's a, this guy's a great businessman and, then, and we'd have him come and he'd put together the party and, and provide all the food for the party. And then we've got Jubal and boy, we're going to have a great show with Jubal. And he's going to be gifted and talented in that area. Why? Because God gives common grace. Verse 22, Zillah also bore Tubal-Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal-Cain was Nama. Tubal-Cain, the inventor of metallurgy, an instructor in this, tools and weapons. All three names derive their root meaning to flow or to produce. They are successful. And we have this sister, Nama, and she's just, according to her name, pleasant or lovely. You benefit from the gifts. And I want you to notice here, there is no evolutionary seasons here. 
As the Word of God tells us, there is no Iron Age and there is no Bronze Age. And there, it doesn't take this long time where you have this, you know, it's like caveman, woman, and you do all this stuff. It's, it's ultimately these are educated individuals that are amazing. And, 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 and you look at this and the amount of time that goes by. Remember, according to, and we'll find this in the next chapter, and because we believe the Bible's true, people could live up to 900 years. And so what this world must look like, we first of all, because of this, this, um, this canopy of water around the earth pre-flood, the, the weather is not a problem. And people, to live 900 years, you've got to be strong. And all that time goes by, you've got a lot of time to get better at stuff. It's like that scene from Groundhog Day. Some of you are with me. Some of you got to go home and watch that tonight. Um, but it's one of those things where time, after a while, you learn and, you, and all these people. And so you have a certain uh, age, you're able to have children. And you have children, you have a lot of them. And it seems, from the Word of God here, that Adam sees all of these generations up to the time when Noah is born. And can you imagine what must be going through Adam and Eve's mind? As they see sin accumulating and growing in such an incredible way. And it's almost like you as a dad or as a grandfather who are watching your children, grandchildren, maybe you didn't invest, maybe you're, or you're just seeing this and you're watching this and it isn't playing out the way you thought it and your heart just breaks. And it's evil, so evil that God at a certain point, and we'll read about it, it's not a nice children's story. It's not, it's not a story that we put it in nurseries. We got the nice little mobile with the arky arky. But do you, real, do you realize people died? And there must have been millions of people. We got this idea that, but you got to realize, 900 years? Twenty-three. Let's go a little bit further here. Lamech said to his Lamech said to his wives, "We got not you see here is poetry. This isn't grunting from a Neanderthal. This guy is Ada and Zilla. Hear my voice. I love this. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. If I said that to my wife, listen to my voice. Kim, you wives, your wife of Mark. She, excuse me, frying pan." Listen to us. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. Is that the word here is accurate. I, nobody messes with me. It's almost like the, the song by Jim Croce, Bad, Bad Leroy Brown. I'm going to tell you how bad I am. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is 77-fold. I'm 11. I am so bad, I write songs about how bad I am. He's got everything but God, and he's totally defiant. And we are, for one aspect of time, we're looking at something that is communicating what the anti antediluvian world looked like. That's a fancy way of saying pre-flood And I love this. In a world like that, verse 4, we see individuals for God. Because you see all their accomplishments. Thank God that there's been accomplishments, even in our culture, of business and music and, and, and um, metalwork and, and all these things that we've been blessed by and we can take advantage of and we can use, hopefully, for the glory of God. And that's being, we are amazing. We're men. We're, we've accomplished so much. And by the way, you, we go into the museums and we see great things and none of those works of art were done by a baboon. God, because he's amazing and has placed the giftedness in, the, in his image in man, we, we have creativity. But, it's a, but we have to acknowledge, but it's a gift from you. We could not do it without you. But it's interesting. As those things are being shouted, look at verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, and this is different because early on when she was talking about Cain and Abel, she used the word Yahweh, Jehovah, 
L-O-R-D capitalized, but she says here Elohim. It's almost like she's so drained by what she's seen and she's not going to gamble anymore and just said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. Could you imagine just her saying that, what that must have been like? We go back to Adam. The ungodly world takes shape, but so does the godly world. God quietly starts to do a work. Verse 26, to Seth also was born, a son was born. He called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. People called upon the name of the Lord. He is the salvation. Romans 10, 13. Romans 10, 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I want to wrap up with this. I want you to think about the fact that all those accomplishments, all those great things that were going on pre-flood, none of those people and their descendants lived. Not one. And out of Seth's line. Ready? I'm going to do my math. Eight people will make it. That's how bad it gets. That's how bad it gets. And so for all the accomplishments without God, as we shout and and scream and make a big deal about them, God's not impressed. It's when we see at the end of that chapter, people started to call out to the name of the Lord. And I want to ask you today, this morning, where are you at? I know maybe in your heart you want to shout out your accomplishments, but I want to say to you, are you calling on the name of the Lord? These guys, when they were sharing their testimony just now about an hour of prayer, maybe that's something we need to do. Maybe this week to say, you know what, those guys and they're sharing their testimony, that's spurring me on. I'm going to take the initiative to do that. And my, oh, I'm so busy. Well, what are we filling our time with? And to say, you know what, honey, maybe you and I need to, to go and pray. Pray for our kids. Pray for our, our grandkids. Pray for our um, brothers and sisters. Pray for the aunts and uncles. Pray for, pray for the church. Pray for this community. Pray for beyond and see what happens. Because that's where things seem to make a difference. Where are we at? We could accomplish so much, but it is what God's trying to accomplish in our lives.